What should you do if you receive a parking charge notice? And how do you know that it is a valid parking charge notice? And what is the difference between a parking charge notice and a penalty charge notice? Those are the sorts of questions I'm addressing today, along with a few others that have popped up in the comments. But first of all, if you're new to me, I'm a barrister who helps you understand law, and I answer your questions on my new daily series over on Black Belt Secrets, linked in the description below. So if you've parked on any kind of car park, it's important to know whether or not it is private land or whether it is a council or local authority run piece of land for parking. The difference is significant because if it is a private piece of land, then it's going to be a privately managed car park of sorts. And if there are signs up as you enter the car park and around the car park to tell you what the parking charges are, and typically there will be pay meters or pay by phone or pay by app and this kind of thing, then effectively on that private land you are entering a private contract and you are accepting that contract by conduct. So there are a number of questions that arise from this. Some people believe uh, mistakenly with respect that if you receive a parking charge notice, and I'll, I'll come on to how they come about in a moment, but if you receive one, a lot of people seem to think that this is an offer of some kind of contract and that you can simply decline and not accept it. In other words, you can ignore it. This is bad advice because it isn't an offer to enter the contract. That has already happened by the time you've parked on the land. So here's how it works. And so dealing with private land first, if you turn up at a privately owned piece of land upon which there is a car park, which is usually managed either by the owner or by some contracted car park management company, then by entering the car park and by parking your vehicle, you are accepting those terms, provided that there is sufficient signage around to tell you what the terms of the contract are. This is usually very straightforward. It will tell you that it's a car park for one. There will be signs up to say that it's a car park. Usually it will say that it is a managed car park and there will be signs to say what these charges are for parking. Importantly, there should also be, at least for it to be enforceable, part of the sign which is clearly visible from most areas of the car park that there are additional charges that apply if you overstay and you breach the terms of the contract for parking your vehicle on that land. So let's break that down. You drive onto the car park with the intention of parking, you park your vehicle and there are signs up that say it is X pounds per hour or X pounds per day and so on. By paying that amount of money, usually into a meter or by your phone, you are accepting by your conduct the terms of that contract to park your vehicle. Some people have said that because there is no written or signed contract that it doesn't apply. That's not really the case because the way this works is that it is ultimately an automated contract in that there is little to no involvement from any other person representing the landowner. This is because there is a pay meter or something of that nature, or even if there is an attendant handing you a ticket as you enter the car park and then you must pay as you leave, if the payment process is an automated stage, then it is not going to benefit from some of the contractual requirements that other contracts for consumers uh, perhaps would. So speaking of the additional charges in the event that you overstay or you simply don't pay, the Beavis and Parking Eye case that went to the Supreme Court addressed the issue as to whether or not such charges amount to a fine. Now this is a key point because private companies cannot issue a fine as such. So the Supreme Court, among other things, considered whether or not this was a fine because that would decide whether or not it was enforceable. The Supreme Court decided that it was not a fine and that secondly, the £85 was not an unreasonable amount to charge for administration and so on for failure to comply with the terms of the contract. So you may well find that most car parks now will have such a clause at the bottom to say that there is a parking charge if you overstay or you fail to pay. Now whether they can take effective steps to enforcing this is another matter. 
because they will obviously need to get your details from the DVLA, which they can usually only do if they are a member of an accredited association. But I deal with that a little bit more in another video. So just to be clear, some of the comments that suggest that you just throw these in the bin is not on the face of it good advice because Whilst it may be difficult in some circumstances for some companies to actually chase you and enforce that debt, if they do in fact obtain your details and take you to court and you have nothing to prove one way or the other, then you are going to struggle and you may well end up either having to pay the money beforehand or with a CCJ ordering you to pay the money. So what should you do if you want to protect yourself and defend such claims? Well, as I often say in my videos, it always comes down to evidence. Every time you enter a car park, whilst this might sound quite ridiculous, if you do take photographs of every sign upon entry and every sign that you see, the area that you park and all these kind of things, you are going to have a body of evidence that you can rely on in the event that you get issued one of these parking charge notices that may or may not be valid. In the event that you get a parking charge notice, which in fact you don't agree with because you've been within the time frame or within the lines and all of these kinds of things, you will only really be able to show that if you have a body of evidence to challenge this if you end up in court. Now, of course, the only way you can be forced to pay this is if there is a judgment debt against you for that amount. They cannot simply send bailiffs to you, although I'm sure some firms do engage the services of so-called debt collectors, even though, strictly speaking, they cannot enforce that debt without a court judgment. Either way, as I say, it's a matter of evidence for you to collate everything together. And whilst this might sound very cumbersome, when you are entering a car park, if you are in any way unsure, a few quick snaps with your phone of the various signs around the car park is far easier than try to recall later on what happened, which is almost certainly going to be flawed. I have had exactly this scenario myself where the machine appeared not to take the code that I was given to validate the parking by a restaurant and the machine just didn't give me anything at all. So me not wanting to receive a parking charge notice, which I would struggle to challenge without any evidence, I took photographs of both the machine, me trying to use the machine, the various signs around the car park, the coupon with the code that I was told was going to validate the car park, which had on it the time and date stamped by the restaurant, all of these kinds of things, so that in the event that I did end up with one of these parking charge notices, either through the post or however, then I was going to be able to challenge it because I would have had all the evidence that on the balance of probabilities, if the matter ever went to court, I could successfully challenge and say, basically this was nonsense because I shouldn't have been issued this because I had a coupon to validate the parking. And as I said in a recent video, one of the biggest downfalls of many clients that I see is not providing either enough or sufficient evidence or in fact any evidence at all. If you end up in court and you have no evidence, effectively the court cannot rule on anything in your favour and you are left down to the challenge of the evidence against you, with which I have had some level of success with with my clients, but that's because I'm a trained barrister and I can take evidence apart against my client from the other party and break their claim down and encourage the court not to find in their favour. But this is far easier to do if you have your own evidence to rely on. So I cannot stress strongly enough that if you are in any doubt, you need to gather this evidence at the outset because a contemporaneous note, contemporaneous being taken at the time, is going to be far more reliable and the court will rely on that on the face of it unless the other party can show, demonstrate and prove, usually with some evidence, that what you've said is not correct. There are also other questions such as whether the colour of the car noted incorrectly on the parking charge notice is going to detract from the notice. Well, all of these things, it's a matter of degrees. If the number plate is precisely accurate but the colour is perhaps slightly wrong, or maybe it was at night and it looks blue, whereas it's really red and these kind of things, then these kind of things are not necessarily going to make a claim fail against you as for a parking charge notice. Equally, I've had some comments or perhaps questions in the comments about whether there is a notice in the window of the vehicle to say that you do not accept the contract and therefore do not agree to any parking charge notice. These are not going to work because ultimately, if you have parked on that land, 
then you are going to be deemed to have accepted the terms of that contract because you are parking there and it's not your land. To do otherwise would be a trespasser and so in any event there's going to be a claim against you which is going to have a reasonable degree of success. Equally for those that are using disabled spaces when you are not disabled or parent and child spaces where you don't have a child with you, each of these would almost certainly amount to a breach of the terms of the contract for the using the car park and equally you may end up with a parking charge notice in those situations as well. So just dealing with the CCJ element for a moment, that's county court judgment. If you end up in court and you haven't paid one of these judgments within the calendar month or 28 days, which is the period after which it's going to be reported on your credit file, obviously you are going to end up with a CCJ on your credit file, which is not going to disappear for six years. So if you do end up with one of these and you don't want to challenge it, then obviously you must pay it within that period of time to avoid it affecting your credit rating. If, on the other hand, you seek to challenge it, then you will need some reason to set aside that judgment. But that's only really going to work if there is a valid reason, such as it was delivered to the wrong address and you haven't taken all reasonable steps to update your address. So for argument's sake, if your address is incorrect with the DVLA, whilst there is an argument there to be made at court to set aside the judgment, ultimately it will be down to the court as to whether that judgment is set aside. But that is a very in-depth topic and subject for another video. And finally, most car parks will and should have an appeals process that you can follow. Many of them will be relatively fair. There are some questions about emergency situations where you have had to park there or you are late because a relative or a loved one or a friend is in hospital and you just didn't manage to get back to the vehicle on time. In those situations the appeal should be successful and I would encourage you to politely state your situation very clearly during the appeals process but again subject for another video. So I hope this video has helped to clarify a little bit more about parking charge notices. Please give it a thumbs up if you find the content useful and remember stay humble and subscribe.